Hello guys. During the next half an hour, we are going to be discussing James Joyce and his short story, Araby. James Joyce was one of the high modernist writers who extended the frontiers of fiction with his experimental writings. Although considered the most cosmopolitan of the modernists, Joyce was, after all, an Irishman. All his writings are set in Ireland. The later works, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, are replete with allusions to Irish history, mythology, and folklore. The capital city of Ireland, Dublin, registers its living presence in Ulysses with landmarks, locations, and shops. James Joyce was born in Dublin in 1882 into a Catholic family as the first of the ten children of John Stanislaus Joyce and May Joyce. John Joyce was an improvident man of unstable income who squandered scarce familial resources, especially in drinking. The assets depleted and the family, which also witnessed John's violence, lacked resources even to meet basic needs. James Joyce was educated at Clongo's Wood College, an elite boarding school run by the Jesuits. Due to declining familial circumstances, he had to be shifted to Belvedere College, a cheaper day school version of Clongo's Wood. The Jesuit education had a deep impact upon his worldview. Even when he rebelled against the doctrines of the Catholic Church, he acknowledged the contribution of Jesuits to his thinking. After completing his school education, he studied at the Catholic National University, which was later to become University College Dublin. In 1903, Joyce left for Paris to study medicine. This was a project which did not materialize. This was also the beginning of a self-imposed exile. Upon his mother's death, Joyce returned briefly to Dublin. On 12th June 1904, he met a waitress named Nora Barnacle. On the 16th of June, he took a walk with her to the nearby village called Ringsend. James Joyce had fallen in love. He immortalized this day for literature by setting his magnum opus Ulysses on the 16th of June, 1904. It was also to become famous as Bloom's Day after Leopold Bloom, the protagonist of the novel. Joyce and Nora settled in Trieste, an Italian city which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Due to Joyce's ideological opposition to the church and its ceremonies, they lived unmarried till 1931 when they had to register their marriage for testamentary reasons. The couple had two children. Joyce and his family lived the rest of their life in Trieste, Pola, Rome, Paris, and Zurich. The financial support of patrons such as Harriet Shaw Weaver, a wealthy suffragist, helped him concentrate upon his literary endeavors. After his works began to come out, he was surrounded by a large group of friends, well-wishers, and fellow writers, including Ezra Pound and Samuel Beckett. Joyce had become a literary celebrity. He suffered from severe ophthalmic problems throughout his life and had to undergo a series of surgeries in the eye. The fact that in his last work, Finnegan's Wake, the sound of words matters more than the sight of them perhaps has to do with his weakening eyesight. A loud reading reveals the hidden words and enriches the meaning of the text. Joyce died of a perforated stomach ulcer in Zurich in 1941. Joyce's works are heavily intertextual, so it is difficult to identify the authors who influenced him the most. Nevertheless, we may note the influence of the French novelist Gustave Flaubert and the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen. On the continent, Joyce was exposed to the world of avant-garde arts. 
This was the time when movements such as Expressionism, Dadaism and Cubism were making their presence felt. Expressionism sought to present the world from a subjective point of view. The Romanian poet Tristan Tsara and the German painter Hans Arp were launching their assault on bourgeois notions of decorum and propriety, both in life and art, with the irrationality of their random art which they called Dada. Joyce also had a gift for languages. He knew Latin, Italian and some Irish. He learned Dano-Norwegian to read Ibsen and spoke German and French fluently. He turned this gift to good account in his last work, Finnegan's Wake, which employs about two dozen languages. Joyce's first publication was a collection of lyrical poems entitled Chamber Music. He was later to publish another collection of words called Poems Penny Each in 1927. But he is known for his fictional writings with the help of which he endeavoured to redefine fiction itself. His first novel was A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It was published in 1916. It is widely considered to be an autobiographical novel, one written by the author in maturity with a retrospective understanding of his formative years. The portrait is a Bildungsroman or a novel of education. It traces the growth of a talented young Catholic man named Stephen Dedalus who aspires to become an artist. In 1918, Joyce published a play called Exiles. Joyce's later works, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, are intricate in form and encyclopedic in content. The self-conscious wordplay of these works, their stylistic innovations and experimental narrative techniques changed commonly held views on language, representation, meaning and reading. Ulysses is a monumental contribution to the world of letters. It was published in 1922. It narrates the non-events of a single day in the life of its main characters, Leopold Bloom, an advertising canvasser and an apostate Jew, Molly Bloom, his wife and a soprano, Stephen Dedalus, a fellow Dubliner who is now a school teacher. Joyce employs the mythical framework of Homer's Odyssey to narrate the story. The chief interest of Ulysses lies not in its plotline but in its formal complexity. In Ulysses, Joyce employs what is called the stream of consciousness technique of narration. Here, the narrative advances through the thoughts of characters. Though he uses the same technique in a portrait, it is in Ulysses that the possibilities of the technique are fully realized. The book also creates meanings at multiple levels. In a lighter vein, Joyce told his French translator, I have put in so many enigmas and puzzles that it will keep the professors busy for centuries arguing over what I meant. And that's the only way of ensuring one's immortality. Finnegan's Wake, published in 1939, is an obscure book for the ordinary reader. In the broadest terms, it is the cosmic dream of an archetypal man. Its nominal narrative deals with the story of a Dublin innkeeper named Humphrey Eowicker, his wife Anna Livia Plurabel, who also personifies River Liffey which runs through Dublin, their twin sons Shem and Sean, and their daughter Issy. The events of the nominal narrative are linked up with historical, mythological, and literary parallels. Apart from multiple languages, Finnegan's Wake also employs puns, portmanteau words, and a thoroughly unconventional syntax. Reading Finnegan's Wake is like solving a puzzle. Arabi is one of the 15 stories 
which together make up James Joyce's collection Dubliners. Joyce wrote the stories between 1904 and 1906, but he had great difficulty publishing them. Finally, Dubliners came out in 1914. The stories present life in the Irish capital in terms of what Joyce called paralysis, a moral and material malaise that debilitated destinies. In a letter to his publisher, Grant Richards, Joyce stated his purpose in writing the stories. My intention was to write a chapter of the moral history of my country, and I chose Dublin for the scene because that city seemed to me the center of paralysis. He said that he wrote the stories in what he called a style of scrupulous meanness. Dubliners is not a random collection. Joyce organized the short stories into stories of childhood, adolescence, maturity, and public life. Araby is the last of the childhood stories. It is narrated in first person from the perspective of an unnamed boy who is on the verge of adolescence. The first person narration helps the author capture the boy's complex and changing moods sensitively. The story Araby takes its title from an oriental fair which came to Dublin when Joyce was 12 years old. The story opens on North Richmond Street in Dublin. The boy narrator lives with his aunt and uncle. Probably his parents are no more. He describes his block and discusses the former tenant of the house, a priest who recently died. The priest has a library. It attracts the young boy. He is particularly interested in three titles in the library. The first is a romance written by Sir Walter Scott. The second is a religious tract and the third a police agent's memoirs. The narrator is part of the group of boys who play in the street. He then talks about a character called Mangan's sister. The name Mangan seems to be borrowed from the 19th century Irish poet James Clarence Mangan, whom Joyce admired a lot. Mangan's sister is a girl who captures the boy's imagination, but he is shy. He hardly speaks with her, but stares at her from his window. He follows her on the street and often thinks of her. These are the moments he relishes in his drab life. Life on North Richmond Street is drab. It is only the children's play which animates the place. The children are interested in the happenings of the adult world. This is clear from the way they observe Mangan's sister. The narrator himself idealizes her in a romantic way. In a typical case of adolescent infatuation, his feelings are so intense that any communication is rendered impossible. Finally, when he gets to speak to her, she asks him whether he is going to the Arabi Bazaar. She also gloomily states that she will not be able to go there because she has already committed to attend a school retreat. Then the boy gallantly offers to buy her a present from the Arabi Bazaar. Enthralled by his new love, he restlessly waits to go to the Arabi Bazaar. He wants to get some grand gift for his beloved, which will endear him to her. He cannot pay attention to the classes. His romanticized image of Mangan's sister merges with that of the Oriental Bazaar. But in order to actually go to the bazaar and buy the gift, he is dependent upon the adult members of his household. On the morning of the proposed visit, he tells his uncle about his intention and requests him to come early in the evening. But the happenings in the evening are quite disappointing. His aunt frets, a guest pays a visit, the boy waits patiently. His uncle arrives only at 9 p.m. He is probably drunk. He equivocates for so long that he almost keeps the narrator from going. 
these show the insensitivity of the adult world towards the needs of the young. Though it is too late, the narrator heads out of the house towards the bazaar. The boy reaches the bazaar at 10 p.m. It is a moment which Joyce would have called an epiphany, a moment of revelation or realization. In this case, it is a negative epiphany. The Arabi market turns out not to be the fantastic place the boy had hoped it would be. It is late and most of the stalls are closed. The only sound he can hear is the fall of coins as men count money. When he stops at one of the few open stalls, the young woman managing the stall is engaged in a frivolous conversation with two young men. Though the boy is potentially a customer, she only grudgingly and briefly waits on him. He fails to buy anything for his beloved. His romantic, idealized vision of Araby is destroyed. So is his vision of Mangan sister and also of love. He leaves the bazaar with shame and anger rising in him. Thus the story ends on note of disappointment. The story Araby needs to be seen in the overall thematic context of the collection Dubliners. Dubliners deals with various kinds of constraints which render fulfillment difficult or impossible. People of all ages face these constraints. For example, in the story called A Little Cloud, professional success eludes Little Chandler. Arabi is also part of the general ambience of frustration and failure in the Irish capital, Dublin. This dismayed Joyce a lot. What the protagonist of Arabi encounters is the childhood equivalent of constraints and discontent in Dublin. The obstacle for the boy is the insensitive attitude of the adults in his household and the tedium of everyday life and among people who do not care, it is likely that his adolescent love will also remain unfulfilled like his desire to buy his beloved a love token. The stagnation or lack of progress is conveyed in the language of the story. For example, North Richmond Street is described as blind, suggesting a dead end. The setting of the story sets its atmosphere and mood. It is dark and dreary Dublin, the crucible of disillusionment and failure. The gloomy atmosphere of North Richmond Street anticipates what lies ahead for the boy. In fact, a major part of the story is about delays and frustrations. Each of Joyce's stories ends in an epiphany, a moment of revelation or realization. The essence or meaning of the situation at hand is revealed in a moment. In the stories of Dubliners, it is a moment of disillusionment, a recognition of failure. It is a moment when the entire life of the character bears on the situation at hand. In Arabi, the negative epiphany occurs in the bazaar when the boy recognizes the failure of his dreams. Remember that for Joyce, trivial objects or happenings are capable of an epiphany. In the present story, it is the clinging of coins in the market which is the focus of revelation. The story Arabi has strong romantic elements. The narrator's dreams are heroic and romantic. He goes on a lonely quest to procure a gift worthy of his beloved. This quest is not different in spirit from the quests embarked on by medieval knights in the name of ideal love. In Arabi, ideal love is personified in Mangan sister. When the quest fails, the boy knight 
sees the world for what it is. It is both a movement from romance to realism and from childhood fancies to the hard realities of adult life. The world has lost its magic. It is no longer enchanted. The story Arabi touches on a number of themes. Let us now discuss some of them. The first major theme in the story is the discrepancy between the ideal and the real. The boy's idealism and his dreams of first love are ironically contrasted with the staid world around him. The street in which he lives is gloomy and dull. His aunt and uncle do not understand the intensity of his anguish and love. The boy has an idealized image of the object of his desire, Mangan's sister. It is not so much Mangan's sister as an actual person that captivates the narrator, but his idea of her. Since the narrator treats Mangan's sister only as an object of romantic desire, not as a person who is herself capable of desires, realities destined to disappoint him. What disappoints him at the end is not only the fact that his idea of love has been dashed, but also that he was so foolish to think so. Though his view of the world may be slightly less romantic hereafter, the painful experience helps him come to self-knowledge. The ideal gives way to the real in the case of the Arabi Bazaar also. In fact, it is in the bazaar that the theme of discrepancy between the ideal and the real reaches a climax. The market is certainly not a marvelous evocation of the romanticized and idealized version of the Middle East nurtured by the West. The prospect of getting his beloved a splendid gift, a love token, invests the bazaar with an aura. It becomes an enchanted place. The very syllables of the name Arabi spell a certain magic for the boy narrator. They have a mystical charm for him. But in reality, the bazaar is full of spurious wares. It is a place of tawdry make-believe. The market operates on the principle of profit, not romance. The mundane sound of the coins late in the evening after the shops have closed destroys the boy's sense of an eastern enchantment. He also realizes in the market that his love existed only in his mind. He realizes the falsity of his dream. Arabi is also a story about coming of age or the movement from innocence to experience. This is an archetypal theme. It lends the story a certain universal appeal. In other words, it is about the initiation of a young boy. He sets out in quest of the ideal. The quest fails, but the process ends in inner awareness, which is the first step towards adulthood. Remember that the story is told in retrospect from the vantage point of maturity. The mature narrator recollects the romantic adventures of his early adolescence. Indeed, there is some irony when the mature author talks about the boy's adolescent infatuation. But he handles the situation quite sensitively so as to convey the intensity of the boy's emotions. Many characters in the stories of Dubliners are repetitive and restrictive routines and mundane details of everyday life mark their portraits. The details of North Richmond Street in Araby convey a sense of monotony in the lives of the people who live there. The boys who play in the neighborhood are somehow able to discover some wonder and charm in these drab and dreary surroundings. The child protagonist of Joyce's first three stories, that is, the sisters, an encounter, an Arabi, 
seek a respite from their monotonous school routine. They feel lonely and bored in their regular routine. In Arabic, the young boy wants to go to the bazaar to buy a gift for his beloved because it offers a chance of escape and excitement. He becomes late in the evening because his uncle himself becomes mired in his work day. The child's envy reflects the monotony and drudgery of the adult world. Unfortunately, the longing for a change results in disappointment. It is a world of immobility and paralysis. There is no escape. Despite Dublin being one of the strongholds of the Roman Catholic Church, Joyce found life in the city spiritually paralyzed. In another short story, Grace, he talks about the failure of organized religion to cater to the spiritual and emotional needs of ordinary people. If we turn to Arabi, ironically, the priest in the story is dead before it start. This shows that religious piety and spirituality are matters of the past. Religion is portrayed as a moribund, life-draining and hypocritical force in Dublin. There is hardly anything in North Richmond Street to evoke spirituality. It is a place of false piety and spiritual aridity. The boy narrator shares these aspects of Dublin life. In fact, Mangan's sister appears as a light in his dark and gloomy world. He invests her with the spiritual beauty which is otherwise missing from life. He finds the vocabulary to describe his love in the experiences of his religious training. For example, the narrator imagines himself to be carrying his thoughts about Mangan's sister the same way a priest would carry the Eucharistic chalice to the altar. In his imagination, sensual desire and sacred adoration blend. Mangan's sister is both a saint to be worshipped and a woman to be desired. She is both the Blessed Virgin and the voluptuous whore. We have come to the end of today's lesson. During the last half an hour, we looked at James Joyce as a writer, in particular his short story, Arabi. We devoted some time to the discussion of James Joyce as a writer, the dynamics of his writing, the major influences on him. Then we had a critical summary of his short story, Arabi. We looked at the different ways in which the story can be interpreted. We discussed it in relation to the overall thematic context of the Dubliners collection. We discussed it in relation to the concept of epiphany. We also looked at the romantic elements in the story. Then we discussed the major themes of the story Arabic.